there this morning. Same passage of scripture. I'll remind you of a few things that we said this morning um, with a little different emphasis, but we know the context there. Titus chapter 2. We'll begin reading with verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. The Bible says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Well, when we come to verse 13, we find a phrase at the beginning of this verse, and it says, looking for that blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight from this passage of Scripture and others, bringing the Scriptures together, talking about looking for that blessed hope. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you that we have the opportunity to come together. Thank you for liberties that you give us that, that are from you. No man has given us liberty to meet here tonight, although we're in a country that we at least still have this liberty. You've given us liberty, and I pray that you would help us to continue to exercise all the liberties that you give us and our soul liberty to follow you and to do your will. Thank you for your word we get to look in tonight. Would you, would you help us as we look? Would you teach us? Would you help seal some things upon our heart? Would you help, help us to understand as we look for the blessed hope, as we look for you coming back, Lord? You'll help us understand something about that, and you'll, we'll end that looking and rejoicing. We need that in our lives, Lord. Help us to rejoice greatly about what you're doing. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Just in a nutshell... We looked at uh, verse 11 through 15 this morning, and we were talking about the grace of God. Um, but in verse 11, we find salvation. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So we find something about salvation in verse 11. Well, we really find out what salvation is. It's, it's of the grace of God. It's not of us. It's not how good I can be. Um, it's what Jesus has done for us by grace, what we don't deserve. Then we come to verse 12, and we saw something about separation. Separation. So we have salvation and separation, and there are things in, to avoid as a believer, and there are things to do as a believer. There's things like that in the Bible. Now, what we believe about the Word of God has everything to do with the way we live in this world, meaning the things that we don't do and the things that we do do in our life. Now, we should live for the Lord out of a love for Him and what He's done for us. That means everything comes out of our motive is we're constrained by His love, and then we serve Him out of what He's done for us. What has He done for us? Well, He saved us. He saved us by His grace, so when He saved us by His grace, we serve Him out of that, and by His grace we serve Him. And by the way, it's by His grace that we find the separation that we find in verse 12. It says, teaching us, what's teaching us? Back to verse 11, that grace of God that brought salvation is teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, those are two different ways of living. And as a believer, we're supposed to live by the grace of God, just like we got saved by the grace of God, and both of those are activated by faith. We believe God to save us, and we believe God to, to work in our hearts and guide us today. And as we do so, this separation that I'm talking about is to the Lord and from the world. Always that way. God helps us when we come into His presence and we have His power. We have whatever we need in our life to live for Him. Don't get it backwards. If you get it backwards, it looks like this. You separation from the world to the Lord. That means we start with worldly things hoping that we're going to wind up with the Lord and His power. But that's not how it works. It didn't work that way with salvation. We didn't start with worldly things and our works to get to God. We started with God who could bring us to himself and reconcile us through his son Jesus Christ and his righteousness. He could give us a relationship with him. Now, as we have this relationship, we now, we don't look to the things of this world and us getting rid of them in order to get closer to him within our relationship with this fellowship. 
This is called separation. But we first separate ourselves to God. We first come into God's presence. We first get filled with His Word, and we say yes to Him, and we yield to Him, and then His Holy Spirit can give us the power we need. Now, this is the separation we're talking about. This is not some checklist that we check off, and uh, we we're good enough now. No, we come, the only checklist you need is get with God. Get with God, and He'll never lead you wrong. He'll always separate you from the world. He'll never lead you into sin. He'll never tell you to sin. Don't ever think that God is okay with sin. He's going to help us. He'll give us power over it. Now, that brings us to verse 13. So we saw salvation and separation. Those are by the grace of God. And it's also by the grace of God that we come to this phrase, looking for that blessed hope. And it says, in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so now we find the second coming of Christ. So if you like alliteration, we have salvation, separation, and second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what we find here. All of that takes grace. It takes me grace to believe he's coming back. Because my flesh doesn't want to believe that. My flesh wants to live like he's not coming back. My flesh wants me to live like I've got 10 more years on earth when I might be, this might be it. He might come right now. He might come back. Or this might be the end of my life tonight. Right? I don't know. So I don't have that long, but that's what our flesh wants to do. It's always a procrastination of our flesh. Oh, we've got time. We've got plenty of time to deal with the things we need to deal with that God's doing in our life. But that's not always true. We see the second coming of Christ here. Now, this doctrine will transform our life as much as any doctrine in the Bible when we understand what it means for us, the second coming of Jesus Christ. John chapter 14 and verse 3 we read this morning, but I'll read it again. Uh, it says this, Jesus was speaking, and he said, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now, by the way, where he's going to prepare a place is not here on earth. He's going to heaven. He is in heaven now, and he's preparing a place, and he says, I'll come again. So he's coming from heaven back to earth again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That's a promise of God. He said, I will come again. Then we found when he left in Acts chapter 1, and verse 9, the Bible says this, And when he had spoken these things, that's talking about Jesus, when he left them the great commission to wait for the power of God and then take the gospel to the ends of the world to be a witness for him, he said this in verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now this is when, this is after the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened. And then he was with his disciples for 40 days. Now he's ascending back up into heaven in their sight. And they're told he's coming back. The same Jesus, not another one. We're not looking for another Jesus. We're looking for the same Jesus that resurrected to come back. And we, we said this morning when we were talking about this passage of Scripture that he was taken up in the clouds and he's coming back in the clouds. That's how he's coming back. He was taken up bodily uh, in a bodily form from them. He's coming back in a bodily form. We, if we saw his hands when he come back in his side, he still got the marks and in his feet. Still got the body. It's a glorified body, but he still has the body with the marks in it which I believe he's going to have for all eternity. And we'll look on it and marvel at what he's done for us on the cross. He was taken up recognizably. We, they saw him. They knew what he was going. They knew. And he's coming back recognizably. Jesus was taken up from his own, and he's coming back for his own. And I'm glad tonight that I'm one of his. And over 300 times in the New Testament, we have the promise that Jesus is coming again. So that takes us to the phrase, looking for that blessed Hope. The grace of God teaches us to look for His return. It helps us on a daily basis when our flesh wants to do everything else besides believe Jesus could come back today. But the grace of God helps us with that. So let's think about this. This blessed hope or the coming of Christ. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it's a day of rapture. This coming of Christ. I want you to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
And we'll go back in a minute to previous verses here in chapter 4, but we're just going to look at chap, uh, verse 16 and 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The phrase I want you to look at is in verse 17, and it says, shall be caught up. We which are alive and remain. So Paul being used of the Holy Spirit to pin this would have been the we and those he's writing to in Thessalonica and those that are with him. He said, if, because obviously they were expecting Jesus to return any time. Now it's been 2,000 years. Well, not quite, but it's been almost that. But he, they expected Jesus Christ to come back at their time at any time because they thought, he thought he could possibly still be alive when Jesus comes back. He said, we which are alive and remain. What's going to happen to us that are alive and remain? He said, we're going to be caught up. Now, people like to say, we don't believe in the rapture because rapture is not found in the Bible. I mean, if, you, if anybody's heard that, everybody's heard that. But do you know what? Bible's not found in the Bible. Let's quit using it. No, you're going to continue to say Bible, right? I usually say Word of God or the Scriptures. But you can say Bible because Bible describes that one book that contains the 66 books of the Bible. Okay, so we talk about rapture. We get it from uh, a Latin word, rapturo. And what does that word mean? Well, rapture just means to be caught up. So the word rapture tells us exactly what's taking place here. Those that are alive will be caught up together, shall be caught up together. And this catching up or this rapture that we find in 1 Thessalonians 4 is the first phase of the coming of Jesus Christ. The first phase. It's a secret phase, if you want to say that. Jesus is coming in the air for the believers. It doesn't say He comes back to earth at this time. It says He's in the air and we get called up to be with Him. When He comes back all the way, that second part of the phase of His coming, the coming of Christ, it's an open phase. Every eye is going to see Him and He's not coming back for us. He's coming back with us. So 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us He's coming to the clouds. We're going to go up to be with Him and we'll be ever, forever be with Him at that point. Um, but then we come to Revelation 19 and we see the last part of that, that phase when He's coming back and He's going to come back to earth, but we're coming with Him. If you look at Revelation chapter 19 and uh, verse 11, it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he, sat, he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. That's the names of God. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, those armies, believe that's us. We're white, our garments are white, we're washed by his blood. We're coming back with him because we're already with him, because he's already caught us up to be with him at the rapture. Now we're coming back to be uh, with him in the battle. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword that it that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now that's describing Jesus coming back, because when he comes back at that time, he's going to cast Satan into the bottomless pit we find here in the Bible. And uh, we're coming back with him. He will come back and set his feet back on. Uh, the earth, but not in the rapture. He will finish His coming back at that point. Um, and so we see that. But this day, this blessed hope that we're looking for, that's said here in our text in Titus, and then here in Thessalonians, is the blessed hope because it's a day of rapture. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is also talking about this event or the rapture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51, the Bible says, Behold, I show you a mystery. 
We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Again, Paul is being used to write this book, and he says we, thinking maybe he's still going to be alive when, when the Lord comes back. We're going to be changed. Everybody else who's died in Christ, they're going to be changed, but, or they're going to be, uh, uh, let's see what the word says. They shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. You see what the Bible says here? In the twinkling of an eye. Boom. That's the rapture. We're going to be caught up in the twinkling of an eye. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. Those that are going to be caught up, twinkling of an eye. Right behind that, we're changed. If we're still alive at that point as believers. This is talking about the blessed hope or the coming of Christ, and that day is a day of rapture. Look back at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're not only going to find it's a day of rapture, but it's also a day of resurrection. The Bible says here in verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians 4, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and listen, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. That's a resurrection. That's a resurrection. Now, there's more resurrections than this in the Bible, but this is the resurrection of the rapture. And the Bible says here in verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them uh, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So, then we which are alive and remain, the Bible says in verse 17. We're going to be caught up. They're resurrected. They're resurrected. Their bodies are resurrected. Let me say that because they're no longer in that body. They're already with the Lord in spirit and soul, and they're going to be reunited with their body when their resurrected body comes out at this time. Now, how can a person get to heaven without dying? Hmm. Hmm. Well, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, well, we're talking about the resurrection. In verse 51, look what the Bible says. Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, a mystery is a, a sacred secret that's revealed by God in His timing. We wouldn't know it if God didn't reveal it. That's what a mystery is. Okay? So now He's revealing a mystery to us. The mystery is we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, when He talks about sleeping, I'm not talking about what you're going to do tonight. Well, I hope you don't do this kind of sleeping tonight. This sleeping means you're dead. You, you've went on. Your body is no longer functioning anymore. Your spirit and your soul, if you know the Lord, you're with Him. If you don't, you're in a place called hell. And the first Corinthians 15, 51 says, I show you a mystery. And this question is the mystery. How can a person get to heaven without dying? The mystery is, is that we shall be changed. The answer to that mystery is be saved and alive when Christ comes at the rapture for the believers. And your body will be changed. I don't know if this body will instantaneously die and we change into the next one or it just changes. Period. Exactly. But it's changing and we don't have to go through the death process. That would be a great day. We could be the generation alive when Jesus Christ comes back. And I'm going to tell you, the shadow seems to be getting shorter and shorter in this world for the coming of Jesus Christ. And this believer's new body, the believer's new body that we're going to get, whether we're alive or dead, it will be a glorified body like the body of Jesus Christ after He resurrected from the dead and then when He was glorified after that. And I'm looking forward to a new body no sin. I won't want to sin. I won't sin in my new body. I wish I could say that now. But I do have power over sin now 
by the Lord. I don't have to sin, but I have a sin nature. And by the way, when I got saved and when you got saved, our sin nature never got changed. We have the same sin nature. Now we have power over it through the Lord. So we got a, the day, the blessed hope of the coming of Christ is a day of rapture. It's a day of resurrection, but it's also a day of redemption. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's good to know. Whatever we're going through now, the sufferings that we go through now, if we even go through any sufferings for Christ, because this isn't talking about our body aches. This isn't talking about we lost money on the stock market or something like that. This isn't the sufferings. The sufferings here is suffering for Christ. And we know very little about that in the United States. Our brothers and sisters around the world are suffering. Um, and many of them suffering at the hands of wicked and evil men who are put everybody on lockdown in their countries. And they're suffering right now. But it says, even if we did suffer, whatever suffering we went through for Christ, it isn't to compare with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That means to come. The Bible says in verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of the corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth. It groans because of the sin curse that's upon the world. And travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Why are we groaning? Waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. If we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we have this sinful body, and inside of us, in who we are, in our soul and spirit, we're groaning. We're groaning to get this body redeemed so we don't have to live in this sinful flesh anymore and we can live in the perfect presence of God. This is the redemption of our bodies in verse 23. We also find that in Ephesians 1, Ephesians chapter 1, and verse 13 and 14, it says, In whom, talking about Jesus Christ, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So there's the sealing of the Holy Spirit that seals us when we receive Jesus as our Savior. And it's, it's going to tell us when, how long He seals us, but He seals us, our spirit and our soul. And the Bible says this, which is the earnest, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, is the earnest of our inheritance, meaning it's a down payment of what we're going to get one day when we get to heaven, until, this is the earnest of our inheritance, until there's a time that we're sealed and we have this earnest, until the redemption of the purchased possession, until the praise of His glory. Until we're finally redeemed, until we're finally, until our body's finally redeemed, but our spirit and our soul is in the final redemption, into His very presence. Then we don't have to be sealed anymore. We're with Him. And we're perfect in His presence presence. So the redemption of our bodies and the redemption of our soul. I want you to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and we'll look at verse 55. Thinking about this day of redemption. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 55. This is what the verse says. O death, where is thy sting? What a question. Followed up by another question. O grave, where is thy victory? I can imagine he just these probably should have had 20 exclamation points after them. Like shouting in victory. You're asking a question, but the question is for, to make a point. That death doesn't have a sting, and the grave does not have victory, because believers that are alive at Christ's coming will not die, but will be changed to have a glorified body. There is no sting in that. Then it says, O grave, where is thy victory? Believers that are dead at Christ's coming We'll get a new glorified body. There is no victory. It's, the grave will not keep the believer. 
the believer's body at least. That's part, that's the one third of us, right? We're spirit, soul, and body. It won't keep our body, but it's going to be changed. The grave has no victory and death has no sting for the believer. It's a day of redemption. But this blessed hope or coming of Christ is also a day of reunion. Go back to 1 Thessalonians with me, chapter 4. These verses are, have preceding, starting in verse 13, what we've already read. But this would appear why the Holy Spirit gave Paul even these words to write here is because some people were confused about believers and their families or friends who had trusted Christ and then they died. Well, what happened to them? What happened now? And it seems to be that the Holy Spirit has given these Thessalonians some insight, which in turn gives us insight, because now we have the Scriptures. And the Bible says in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant. That means you just don't know about these things. Brethren, concerning them which are asleep, now that, that is dead, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So when someone dies, we sorrow. But it says we ought not to sorrow like those who don't know where their family members are at. Or they do know and they're grieving because they do know. Because it's not, the, it's not heaven. For if we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, and they did believe that, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He's going to bring them with him. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like a reunion. They've already went ahead. The Bible says in verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That means we're not going to prevent them. We're not going to precede them. We're not going to be caught up before them. Their bodies are going to be caught up to meet their spirit and soul, and we're going to be caught up, and we're going to go together. We're going to be changed if we're still alive. We'll, we'll be changed at that moment. Look at verse 18. And the Bible says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We know what's comforting? How many of you know somebody's in heaven? Family member, friend. Look at that. Look at the reunion. The reunion. They're waiting for us. It's day there. We're all going to get there the same day. There's no night there in heaven. There's going to be a reunion, and we're all going to get there the same day. It's a great reunion. That's why it's a blessed hope. We're looking for His return. We're looking for that re-rapture because we're looking for resurrection. We're looking for the final redemption. And we're looking for a reunion. And by the way, there will be no goodbyes in heaven. Only reunions. Only reunions there. And then, that blessed hope or the coming of Christ leads us to a day of rejoicing. I want you to go to Revelation 21 with me. There's going to be nothing to get down about at heaven. And once we get there, look what the Bible says about the new Jerusalem. In Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. There's going to be rejoicing there. None of those things will be there. We have a lot to look forward to. That's a blessed hope. There's going to be singing there, there's going to be praising there, but there's going to be rejoicing in the Lord's presence. He said, He, God Himself, in verse 3, shall be with them and be their God. That's going to be the greatest thing about heaven Amen. is the very presence of God. He's going to be there with us. Listen, I'm looking forward to the rapture. I hope it happens in my lifetime. Could happen tonight. 
Paul was looking for it. I believe we're looking for it. I believe when you read the Bible, you should be looking for it according to the Bible. Jesus Christ coming back for us. He's coming. His second coming is called that blessed hope. Why? Because it is a time of rapture. It is a time of resurrection. It is a time of redemption. It's a time of reunion. And it leads us to a day of rejoicing. And the question is tonight, are you looking for that blessed hope? We can be looking for a lot of things, but are you looking for that blessed hope? We need to help other people look for that blessed hope. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the promise you give us here that you're coming again. You're appearing. And we're looking for that. Oh, we need you to help us. Oh, this flesh gets so overwhelmed with things and we're looking at things here on earth and we're not, we're not looking to you by faith like we ought to be. We're not looking for your return as if we don't believe you're coming back. Would you help us, Lord, not to be so short-sighted and living by sight that we don't believe that. May it help us. May it change us today. May we rejoice. We start rejoicing now because we're going to be rejoicing then. We have the earnest. We can rejoice. We can have what you want us to have in this day, in this hour, by the indwelling person of your Holy Spirit with us. And Lord, I pray you'd guide us and direct our thoughts at this moment. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Altars are open if you need to come and talk to the Lord. I want to ask you if you're here tonight, first of all, maybe you're here and you say, Brother Justin, I don't know if I die tonight that I'm on my way to heaven. I've never received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I've never found myself to be a sinner. I never understood that and that I deserve to go to hell, but Jesus did everything in His death, burial, and resurrection to pay for my sins, that I could have eternal life. I've never believed on Him or received Him as my Savior. Would anybody here say, I'm that way, and I'm concerned about if I die, if I'm going to heaven, or if Jesus come back tonight, I'm not ready to meet Him. Anybody like that tonight? Raise your hand and say, that's me. I'm not sure, Brother Justin. I see that. I'm not, I don't want you to do anything. I just I want you to know that you can trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Believers, the thought of Jesus Christ coming back should help us to want to separate from wickedness, should help us want to rejoice and to see, each, and see others saved by witnessing to them. What's it doing for you? If you're here and you raised your hand that you're not sure you're going to heaven. If you'd like to talk with somebody, we'd sure love to talk with you and share the scriptures with you. Be somebody down front, we can talk with you about that, or we can talk with you after the service. If you'll just come to me, we talk about it. It is of utmost importance to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, especially in this time, this wickedness of our world is getting worse and worse. And Jesus is coming back any day. It feels like it. Father, thank you tonight for your thoughts here and your word. Thank you for the truth that you're coming back. We're looking for that blessed hope. It is comforting to us to know that you are coming back to get us. And until that time, may we live in the power of your Holy Spirit in our life to have victory over sin, to have victory in our lives uh, and over everything that we desire to do that's not in your will because of this sinful flesh. Father, I pray for the one that raised their hand. They're not sure. I trust, Lord, that tonight, Lord, they might be sure before they leave here that they know you. Lord, please guide us this week. Will you seal our, these things in our heart from this morning, from tonight? The truth here we find in this passage of Scripture. Oh, we need your grace. Without it, we're going to do what we want to do. But with it, will be granted a measure of strength and power from on high that we can do what you want us to do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make Him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.
God bless. And if you raised your hand and you want to talk to me after the service, I'd love to talk with you.